Welcome to week three. It's the Rams against the Arizona Cardinals. I'm Gilbert Monsano, Rams beat reporter for the OC Register LA Daily News, and always joining me here on House of Horns, Victor Corona, Victor Producer. Victor, it's finally NFC West action. We're at that part of the schedule where the Rams are facing rivals. The Arizona Cardinals, they played them three times last year, and, and one of them was that ugly wild card game for the Cardinals. So maybe they're looking at this game as a revenge game. Uh, but, Victor, I want to start off the show by saying we have some big news. House of Horns, over 100 subscribers on YouTube. Yeah. We are excited about that. Victor, it's week three, and we're already at 100 and something plus. Keep going up, Victor, subscribers. How are you doing, man? I'm I'm doing well. Uh, I, yeah, thanks to that uh, Cooper Cup uh, video that you had. You know, thanks to everybody who's been uh, subscribing. We appreciate that. I think the next step for us is to get uh, people to comment so we can get some uh, questions in for you and and myself, and that way we can add them to the show here. So. But we'll get there. We're slowly building the brand. You know, the the compass on the B network is growing little by little. So it's awesome. But how, how about yourself, man? I know you had a long day at uh, Rams practice. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here with uh, my at my girlfriend's apartment. You know, you probably see the backgrounds different, uh, but I'm here at Caroline's and she has multiple cats now. They, she had one cat and now she has two. So if you hear a, a cat crying in the background, Victor and, and viewers at home, you you know why. So, uh, yeah, that's an adjustment. Two cats here in the house, but that's okay. I won't complain. You know, it, it was a, a, a good day of practice, you know, in the locker room. You know, got to, you know, talk to Matthew Stafford. Got to hang out with Jalen Ramsey in the locker room. So, uh, everybody's fired up for this uh, NFC West game. And then, Victor, before I forget, uh, yeah, you're correct. I want more engagement on this uh, channel here yeah, I want people to ask questions. We tried doing a video saying, hey, ask us questions. We, we want to answer them here on this on this podcast, uh, a game preview episode. But, I, I, you know, I'm not afraid to say, you know, we didn't get a comment. I think people are just yeah. a little shy, a little timid right now. Eventually, we'll get people going. You know, we're encouraging. You know, we want people to, you know, jump on. You know, you'll be surprised. We'll, we'll drop some knowledge. We'll help you out. We'll try to answer all those questions. You know, hopefully we'll get one. And when we get that one, Victor, we're going to make it. You know, pop, give it a shine, and, and tell that person thank you. And then eventually, it's gonna become like fifty questions. And we're gonna try to get all all of them in there as soon as, as much as we can, as soon as possible. Uh, but Victor, I don't want to bury the biggest part of the show. We have a big time guest, a good friend of ours, an OG compa, Jose Romero. By the way, Jose goes with an M in the middle. I gotta ask him what that middle M is for, uh, for him. But you know, us uh, Mexicans, we like to have long four names. You know, mine's Gilberto Antonio Manzano Rodriguez. I'm sure, Victor, you had a long mine one. Mine is Victor Javier Corona Avena. So, yes. So, yeah. So, I'm guessing uh, Jose has something there. But Jose M. Romero is from the Arizona Republic. He covers the Arizona Cardinals. And he's going to jump on in a few minutes. And I, I get a lot of people come on. I think I just heard the cat crime. I think a lot of people come on to watch his game preview because they want to learn about the opponent of the Rams in week three or and learn more about the Rams, uh, the team itself. But, you know, you're going to like the stories from Jose. Jose drops a lot of good stories about how he got started in journalism from his background uh, to his family to what he had to do during COVID and to eventually become a Cardinals beat reporter. So, you know, be patient. You're going to enjoy the story. And then eventually we'll get into uh, the week three matchup between these NFC West rivals. Yeah, no. And, you know, you need You want to say uh uh, and wait for the interview because he gets into some stuff about Kyler Murray that I was kind of surprised by, especially like everybody talking about how he's uh, he's just into video games and stuff. And he dropped some nuggets on there about Kyler Murray that I was kind of surprised by. So, yeah, you, you definitely want to stay tuned for that one. Uh, but before we get to the whole in it, uh, uh, breaking down the the uh, the Rams and Cardinals game. uh I kind of wanted to make sure that we talked about what we have coming out or what's already come out. We had the Compass on the Beat, the big show come out uh, yesterday. And so make sure that you're, you're subscribed, you're following. There's some great stuff from the guys, from uh, Gilberto, uh, from uh, Fernando and Dan and Dago. I mean, we have so much fun on there. It's a fun show. 
make sure you go and you listen it's and or watch and you know same thing if you if you guys have any questions we also have a segment on there called avocado rolls where we kind of get into some pop culture stuff and you know anytime you want to uh have a comment please let us know and then we'll we'll get to it but let's get to why we're here uh give us you know the information today from practice what are some of the new uh news and notes from practice gilbert yeah i, I think uh what people always want to know about is van jefferson the wide receiver the third starting receiver for the rams it's been a little interesting we we ask every single day or every time we speak to sean mcveigh about van jefferson and that's because they make it seem like there's always going to be a chance that he'll practice or maybe or maybe go he he wasn't placed in ir so we keep asking constantly and then today when we asked Sean McVay about Van Jefferson, because it's a new week, he pretty much was like, yeah, I don't think he's going to practice this week, which pretty much says he won't play in week three against the Cardinals. So that's already three games for Van Jefferson. If he misses another one, you're, you're, you're asking yourself, why didn't they put him on IR? What was going on? Was there a setback? Was it something you weren't expecting for Van Jefferson? So, you know, it, it's always tricky because, you know, Van Jefferson had the surgery in, I think, August 1st, maybe July 31st. And the kid, they were very optimistic. Oh, he'll come back in two weeks, you know, maybe a month. And it's been over that. And that's why you're, that's why you didn't ever want to believe some of these, like, you know, positivities. But then you heard Jalen Ramsey saying he has sh uh, shoulder surgery in June. Right. He, he's going to come back soon, which he did. So you never know with these things. They take time. Everybody's different. So that's one of the big ones. And then on the offensive line, Victor, they're now down to their third starting right guard of the season. Uh, I guess it doesn't really count with Coleman Shelton. He was forced to move right guard to back up uh, center Brian Allen. So then that created uh, a, an opening there. And then Tremaine Ankrum, I'm saying his last name properly. Ankrum. Uh, Ankrum came in and then, you know, he got hurt. He broke his ankle out for the year. He got hurt on the first play, Victor, right. against the Falcons. Tried to tough it out for a second play. And Stafford was telling us, and Ankrum was like, Hey, I, I saw Tremaine. I told him, are you okay? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Even though he knew he wasn't okay. Try to play one more snap. And obviously he couldn't. He fell down and got carted off. So that now leaves us with uh, Alaric Jackson. Hopefully I'm saying Alaric's name properly or Alaric. I got to figure it out. But it, they used to call him AJ. Now he wants a full name. So hopefully we were not butchering the name. But Jackson, he was a second round pick last year. He was drafted to be a guard. Doesn't have much experience. Sorry, he was drafted to be a tackle. Doesn't have much experience being a guard. Came in on short notice last week, and he was actually pretty fine. You know, the whole unit only gave up uh, one sack, so he did okay. And then they they uh, moved up Ode Abushi, the veteran guard who used to play for the Chargers, as just in case, you know, things go uh, wrong again. So that's where they are with the offensive line. And then, you know, for the last no, what, what else is out there, you know? Leonard Floyd has a big old knee brace, but he was practicing. He's fine. Yeah, no, oh, fine. David Long. He is now in the injury report, another cornerback who has a groin injury, and that's not good for, for another corner to be on there because Kobe Durant has a hamstring uh, strain. Troy Hill is an IR. That's another one we, I could have remembered yeah. about because that was on Tuesday. So There's a bunch of injuries. I were wasting a lot of time on news and notes, but the injuries are piling up, and they're very you know shorthanded offensive line, especially in the interior. They're shorthanded at cornerback. Uh and then when they, I saw David Long today, I was like, okay, that's they're, they're really short there. So uh, we'll see what they do. And in terms of other stuff, you know, check out my story on OC Register. I just posted a story on Daryl Henderson, uh, mentioning that Daryl Henderson's numbers are not popping, but he's been steady. He's been consistent. You're about to see the cat go by. There it goes. <laughs> I was waiting for that. Uh, but but Daryl Henderson, check out the story. He's been steady. And the way I like the reason why I wrote about the story, yeah, the number's not popping for Daryl Henderson, but this guy is just a really, this is my first time talking to him. He was laid back, chill. He's like, yeah, we got wide receivers playing fullback. I'm going to take this guy down again. <laughs> we got wide receivers <laughs> playing fullback. We're down to our third right guard and so on and so, and he's just making it work, man. So he got a touchdown last week, uh, and he just has this calm presence, presence about him that when things are look like they're going, I just gave you a bunch of stuff about the, the offense, and he just seems like a cool, chill guy. So check out the story in the OC Register. And unless I'm missing something that's not injury-related in terms of news, uh, well, actually, they signed Tack McKinley, former UCLA standout, first-round pick of the Falcons in 2017 to have some pass rush help. And now the cat wants to start crying. Victor, it's going to be a long show. 
But yes, yeah. he signed he signed Tack, and we'll see how he does. Yeah, no, uh, I was gonna say I thought one of the the cool quotes from your story was uh, Cooper Cup, uh, the whole block uh, about uh, him blocking Cooper Cup blocking for for Daryl Henderson on that touchdown. I thought that was a really cool quote from that you got from him. Uh, the other one that I wanted to ask you about was the whole Bryce uh, Hopkins uh, suspension. Oh, yeah. If you can tell us about that. Yeah, next time I'm, I'm gonna start writing them down because this, is, this has been a busy. Uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, these news and nuggets came out. So I'll write them down for the future. But yeah, Bryson Hopkins is another one. I got you, man. Don't worry. No, that's the, thank you, sir. This is why we're a duo. But yeah. this is another part that I, I need to get, I need to drop the news before I get my analysis. Uh, but yeah, Bryson Hopkins was suspended three games without pay for substance abuse, which makes me think it's like a marijuana base or something. I don't know, but it doesn't sound like it's PED. So. He was suspended for three games for that. Um, and then now that technically they have only uh, one tight end on the active roster as of Wednesday, which is Tyler Higby, obviously. So I wouldn't be surprised if they move up a Roger Carter from the practice squad uh, or a Jared Pinky from the practice squad to have more than one tight end, Victor. But the crazy part is like, does it really matter? Unless it Tyler Higby goes down, it definitely matters. Uh, right. But, you know, Bryson Hopkins only had four snaps offensively in the first game and another four in the second game and zero a donut in terms of target. So that's yeah. my other point of being annoyed at the preseason training camp because we spend so much time on these guys like, oh, Bryson Hopkins is looking good. And then the season comes and not much is going on. And he's suspended three games. So, yeah, that could be an issue. Victor Tyler Higgy being the only, you know, at least experienced tight end. But when you got Ben Skoranek helping out as a blocker, he could play a fullback, yeah. he played tight end. Uh, then you could, you know, call up, you know, Jacob Harris, maybe give yeah, last you know, okay? yeah, yeah, Jacob Harris. These guys from the training camp we're talking about, bring them up because they're yeah. very thin at tight end. And Victor, I don't know what else do we have because my no. brain is fried. No, go. no, that's it. Let's get to. We don't want to bury our our guests here, so let's go ahead and get to our our guests. Jose, I want to start this interview segment by saying. We're here. We've arrived because our guest reminded us that we're here. We're doing it. And I'm so excited to introduce this guest because he's an OG real compa, a supporter from afar, just telling us that he's been watching us for the last few years, growing our compas on the beat. We're branching out to House of Horns. Long overdue. But our guy, Jose Romero, uh, Arizona Cardinals beat reporter for the Arizona Republic. Jose, how are you doing? How's the beat treating you? Honored to be here, guys. Man, I it's kind it's so crazy to think about it. You know, seven seasons covering the Seattle Seahawks back in the early 2000s, and here we are, all these years, 15, 20 years later, and I'm back covering the NFL, doing the Cardinals. This it, it's a long story of how I got here, but um, you know, I'm sure you guys are slightly aware of it, somewhat aware. But but I'm I'm back to it, and I'm I'm thrilled. I'm honored, and it's opportunities like this that you know, make it all worthwhile. Man, that's awesome to hear that, you know, you're back in the NFL because for, for a while, I kept counting on my finger. It was like, how many Latino NFL B reporters are there for, for a major English outlet? It's like, is it me, Paul, Fernando, I, and, and I think a few people in Florida. Uh, yeah. So I'm glad to have you, Jose, add into the numbers. They're small, but we're growing. But that kind of brings me to my next question because I see the Mexico jersey. I'm guessing you're, you're excited for the World Cup. I know Victor is. Uh, so a couple questions. You said Seattle, you're in Arizona right now. Where is home home for you and where is home for the family in Mexico? And give us a couple more stops in your journey yeah. and career that you could share too. Okay. Well, uh, let's see. Um, I'm very much rooted in the United States. My, uh, I'm like third or fourth generation on my dad's side. Um, my mom's side, my grandmother was born in Guadalajara, Jalisco. Um, family grew up in Ventura County. Uh, Oxnard, Moore Park, Moore okay. Park represent, man. Love that place. Yeah. Yeah. Great five. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's the home, home area where it all started for my parents who grew up only about 20 miles apart. And, um, you know, they moved up to, they, they came up to Oregon, uh, before I was born. And my dad was a graduate student at the University of Oregon. Um, he's like a really super smart, brainy person and always has been. And, um, and that's where I was born. So it's, it's been Oregon for life ever since. And, uh, 
um, went to the University of Oregon. I kind of I was I was born to go there because uh, my whole family, my mom and dad went there, my sisters went there, I went there, so uh, we're big ducks in our house. And um, you know the the so the roots are in Oregon, the Portland area. Uh, going back to Mexico, pretty far back. I don't even think I have family there anymore. To be honest, I couldn't even tell you. But um, but home now is in South Phoenix in Arizona. Um, uh, I love my neighborhood. Um, you can go. This is the type of neighborhood where you could spend. You could go the whole day without having to speak a word of English. So um, it's uh, it's it's really cool. Like I've never really had the experience of living in a largely Latino Mexican neighborhood in my life, and this is the first time. And it, it's pretty cool, man. It's pretty wonderful. So. With a career, man, it just it got started uh, many, many moons ago in the mid 1990s after I got out of school and um, late, late, mid to late 90s when I got out of school. And, you know, I, I was a late start. I got kind of a late start to the whole thing. Um, thought I was going to be a teacher for a little while. Somewhere along the way, a family friend said, hey, you're a good writer. And I'm like, you think so? And then I went to work at a TV station and the news director who eventually fired me told me that I was a good writer. So I kept hearing from people along the way, you write really well. And, I, and so it finally clicked, uh, maybe I should pursue this a little more. So the family friend offered me a, a job, a position as a freelancer at her newspaper, which was a bilingual Spanish and English paper in Portland. And from there, it just took off, man. I got a, got a job at a small bi-weekly paper in the Portland area, got an internship with the Seattle Times, uh, moved around to all their papers, Yakima, Washington, Walla Walla, Washington, Pacific Northwest, all the way. And then um, ended up in Seattle, spent 11 years, almost 11 years there, covered the Seahawks, covered the Seattle Sounders for their first year in existence. Um, you know, college sports, started out in high schools, paid my dues. Um, man, that was good. I look back on that and that, those, those were some of the good times, man. Even though it was hard, it was just good, you know. And yeah. Um, Moved to Arizona without without uh, too much job prospects because I really wanted a family. I wanted to get married and start a family. And um, to do that, I made the move to Arizona. And it took a long, long time and a lot of years of freelancing, a lot of hustling, a lot of working at Costco, pushing carts in the summertime, in the heat, just odd jobs. I mean, I was an usher at the Cardinal Stadium in 2010. Wow. I had a, I was an usher. I was like showing people to their seats. I was like looking out for people fighting. You know, I had like a walkie talkie just in case, you know, so I could call the cops. But um, I mean, I just look back on all these little odd things I did in my adult life, man, when I'm supposed to be in the prime of my career, you know, but I'm doing this stuff, trying to get back. And then I taught at Arizona State, tons of odd jobs, finally landed a job at Arizona at uh, the Republic after years and years of applying. You know, probably had four different applications that got turned down. And here we are. 2020, I got hired two years later. Covered the hockey team, Coyotes, for the first two for my first two years, and then jumped over to the Cardinals. So I hope that did not take up too much time, but that's it. No, that was awesome. Mm-hmm. No, no. And I just wanted to say, for those that don't know, uh, I know I was telling Gil and uh, Jose before we jumped on that, Jose actually gave me my first shot out of college. And so I got to do a couple of stories. I was able to do the Julio uh, Julio Auria story uh, at the Sporting Nation. But you had a you talked about it uh, when as you were talking about you had a story on so, uh, Somos uh, Sports about yeah. your your uh, three months as an essential worker. Can you give us just a little bit of that? Uh, talk about that. Oh man. Uh, okay. So so um, it starts in uh, in. March of, of, 20, of 2020, right before the pandemic hits. I'm freelancing for the Associated Press. I'm going to spring training. You know, I'm going all over the valley here uh, to different spring training sites, covering, doing stories for the Associated Press. Awesome gig. I did it every year for 10 years. And uh, it was a good money maker for me. But um, COVID comes around, right? Coronavirus comes, uh, shuts down everything. And I remember just, you know, thinking to myself after that Thursday, it was a Thursday, I'm pretty sure, when they shut everything down, the last interview I did was with Kendall Graveman, who's a pitcher. Uh, yeah, I think he's still playing. Yeah, yeah. Still, still pitching. Um, and that was it. And then everything shut down. I never went back. Um, obviously, you know, spring training was canceled. And 
I'm thinking to myself right away, okay, everything's dried up because the freelancing's dried up. There's no sports, nothing going on. I'm a guy who can't sit still. I got to work. You know, I got to, I got to contribute. I have a family. So, you know, my wife is still working and I decided, look, I can't just sit around and, you know, do nothing. I immediately, I figured that the grocery stores and like the big stores would be the ones that were going to be hiring because, you know, people still needed stuff. So I was online. I looked up Costco. I saw that they were hiring. I just, I, I think I called a number. I clicked on something, and then I called a phone number. I got a call back like five, literally five minutes later, and this was like at six o'clock at night. They're saying, "Hey, come on down to this store. We'll see what you know. When you're on. You're in." So as soon as I get there, uh, you know, get my badge, get all set up. The next two days later, I start work, and man, it was hard. I I have so much respect for the Costco employees because you have to be constantly on the move, like on the go. Uh, they don't let you, I mean, like they have like Hawkeyes everywhere because they watch you. If you're not like doing something, then they like get on you. And you know, and I'm like, you know, I'm an older guy. Like, I don't need somebody telling me what to do, right? But you know, it, it's it's going back to the that roots of like, I worked in a grocery store when I was in high school. And um, you know, cause it kind of felt like that, but we were all just temporary employees. And anyway, some guy uh, recommended to the, the manager, uh, Hey, we need some help outside on pushing the carts around, you know, putting the carts back in the cart areas. And it was, you know, it's in the summer, man. It's like 110 degrees out there in Phoenix. I don't want to be out there. I'd rather be inside, like boxing up groceries. But guess, lo and behold, guess who gets stuck out on the cart crew? Me. So uh, spent a lot of three months summer nights out there in the heat, man, wrangling carts, man. It was a, it was a shock to the system. It hurt my pride, but the friendships I made in that short time, the people I worked with, man, just good, good people. A lot of Mexican people. I mean, this was a store out in East Phoenix, pretty close to a really pretty nice neighborhood and Scottsdale too. But yet the employees, you know, I related to a lot of them. And so we had a guy from Jamaica, we had some Hawaiian people, you know, it was just a great like community building thing as an experience and a great job. The job and the work was really hard, but uh, but I needed the money. We needed the money, and you know, then I broke my foot because uh, I think my body just was not used to being on their on his feet so much, and um, that was the end of that. Luckily, fortunately, a couple months later, the job with the Arizona Republic came. So, how about that? Nice. Wow, well, well, Jose, thank you for for sharing your background. Uh, I wish the interview was pretty much based on you. I, I want to get to know you more and the way. You, you've got to this point because a lot of people have different journeys, you know, yourself, me and Victor, have, we all have our own story to tell. We all have different paths, you know, usually for for, for us, you know, Latinos, it's a little, it's a little longer road to get to where we want to go Absolutely. Uh, in, this, in this business and journalism. But, you know, we're, we're paving the way, we're, we're putting our dues, we're, you know, we're, we're working hard. Uh, and then you reminded me, like, you know, my, one of my first starts for me was that I was an intern at the Arizona Republic when I was in college. And that kind of, you know, catapulted me because it put my name out, out there because I was in an internship with people from from Yale to Stanford to UCLA to USC, and I'm over here from Cal State Northridge, competing. But you know, I was there, you know, rubbing elbows, you know, doing my thing. So uh, we need to have like a podcast about how we, all of us had our, our journey to get to where we are. But I'm glad you're at the Arizona Republic. You're, you're doing your thing. I can only imagine how many Latinos were covering hockey when you were covering the Coyotes, uh, Jose. I was gonna say, there you go. That's the number. I'm One, here, I'm one guy in Vegas. One guy in Vegas. That's it. Uh, is it? Was it Willie? Willie. Yep. Oh, okay. All right. There you go. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, there are not many. I'm over here counting on, on my hand for the NFL, but imagine hockey. So, uh, but Jose, let's get to this big uh, NFC West uh, showdown between the Rams and the Cardinals. And before we start breaking down this matchup, I got to ask you about the chaotic game. You're, I'm guessing you were there in Las Vegas for, for yeah. the Raiders Cardinals. Yes. Uh, I think Kyler Murray is still running around the field, trying to get that two point conversion. <laughs> <laughs> Jose, uh, what was your biggest takeaway from that game? Because they were down 20 to zero. They come back firing to win the game. Uh, what did you see from your point of view? And what do you remember the most from that chaotic game? Well, I have to start with, with uh, there's always, there's always been a little soft spot in my heart for the Raiders um, because, because of the history that they have of, you know, hiring, you know, Jim Plunk, bringing in Jim Plunkett and, and Tom Flores and all the diversity hiring that they've done over the years, a lot of groundbreaking stuff. Uh, so, you know, and I think, 
we all got a little raider in us, right? As as Mexicans, as Latinos, you know. So when I'm walking around outside on the tailgate, it was like a family reunion. Like, you know, it was like it was like I was back in Ventura County with my primos and my tios over there. And it's that's what I loved about it. The whole Vegas experience. That was what stood out for me non game. Just being out there and seeing all the people faces painted and being Raider fans. And uh, I related because it's, uh, you know, the first game I ever did as a first road game I ever covered as a beat writer for the Seahawks was Oakland, Oakland Coliseum Raiders. And I got off the train there at the, the, the BART station and in the tailgate lot, they're offering me tacos and food and nicest. You couldn't have picked nicer fans. So they get a bad rap. But anyway, long story short, um, we go. Uh, so the game was, uh, I mean, they were dead in the first half. The Cardinals were just, they looked completely deflated. The body language looked bad. Um, they could not establish anything offensively. Kyler Murray wasn't in a good rhythm. Um, the Raiders had a ton of energy feeding off that huge crowd. And um, it just, it looked like it was over. You know, it, it literally looked over at halftime. And something happened. I don't know what was said in the, in halftime or what, but, but Kyler Murray came out with a whole different attitude and approach. What that, what they really needed was they needed their defense to step up and make some stops. And when they finally started doing that in the second half, that got the offense going. Um, they have not been able to establish the run with James Conner, who's a pretty damn good running back. And they just, I mean, in two games, he's got 51 yards total of rushing. So that's, that's an issue. But, you know, Kyler started hitting his receivers all over the field. And keep in mind, this is a shorthanded team. There's no DeAndre Hopkins. He's suspended. You know, they're throwing to a guy named Greg Dortch, who was, you know, a guy on the bubble to make the final roster. And now he's the fourth. So, um, you know, then he starts getting his good buddy, Hollywood Brown, involved. Uh, Zach Ertz comes back and has a big game himself. You know, he's catching passes. Um So the offense is moving and guys are making plays and there were so many near misses that they had to have. They had to have all these, these two point conversions, two, two point conversions that they had to have, you know, had to have, I think they went for it on fourth down three times and got them every time. And um, that was the thing, man. It was just, everything had to fall into place at the right timing in order for it to happen because they scored the two point conversion with no time left on the clock. It was an untimed down. With no with no time left in regulation to send the game into overtime, and how about the throw from Kyler to AJ Green for the two point conversion? I mean, Threaded it's like needle. throwing a needle through a haystack. You know, the only the only Kyler makes that throw in that place, and um, he really came of age came of age as a leader. I think in that game, I you know ever since he signed the big contract, uh, the big contract uh, extension, they've been. I think he's taken on more of like a leadership role. Some, some guy who's more accountable, who's willing now to step forward and be vocal and um, definitely been out there more in the community, I would say. And on the field, um, you know, just really being a different sort of person. And I really believe that the contract has, has allowed for that. You know, he realizes he's making big money. There's a lot of pressure on him. And so he wants to show, look, I can handle this and I can lead my team and I can, carry my team if I have to. And that's exactly what he did. Jose. Uh, Jose. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go yeah. I was going to say, uh, my next question was going to be, how has he been since uh, the whole contract with the contract and the mess with the, you know, too many video games, I watch more film. Uh, so it's been going a lot going on with, with Kyler, but you, you answered my question. So I was going to just, sorry for cutting you off, Victor, but that was my thing. Like, is he, is he a guy? Does it feel like a franchise quarterback? And it seems like that game, uh, was like, okay, this is what the guy they paid for. So, yeah. uh, Victor, I'll let you take it away because, uh, Jose, you answered my question. Yeah, no, Jose, I was going to, I was just going to ask, I, I know they looked terrible the first six, uh, quarters. So, and I, and Clint Kingsbury and the GM have contract extensions, so they're not on the hot seat, but how does the fan base feel about, uh, the people up top and the head coach? I think that that's a great question. I think there's, there's a mixed reaction there. I think there's a lot of people who, you know, criticized the general manager, Steve Kine, uh, for the draft, you know, for his draft history. A couple of guys have panned out. A lot of guys haven't. And, and in some cases, guys that they have drafted and tried to develop, they haven't really used them the right way. You know, you've got a guy in Isaiah Simmons, for example, 
who is, uh, is in his third year. He was a first-round pick, and they really haven't found a definitive position for him. So the defensive coordinator, Vance Joseph, labeled him a star backer. And what the, what's that, right? The linebacker who's a star, I guess. But um, so this is a guy who's super athletic, super talented, but they just have not been able to find a specific place for him. And, um, and some of that falls on, on the general manager, you know, for drafting guys who maybe – need better type of development. And so there's criticism out there for sure. This is a, this is a pretty passionate fan base over here. Um, you know, as it is in, in every NFL city, right. But, but with the, with this team, I mean, this, this town is a Cardinals town. Now the Suns have been going great for the last couple of years, but the Arizona Cardinals get all the clicks, all the to- all the talk on the radio. And, um, and then you look at the coach, uh, Cliff Kingsbury, you know, um, came in here without a winning record in college. And yet there was a belief that a young guy like that could be, could guide this team to, to take this team to newer heights. Uh, pretty successful. He's got a, he's got a history of being really good in the beginning of seasons, but in the second half of seasons, his teams falter. So there's always that degree of, you know, obviously we want our team to do great, but the fans also are skeptical because they're just waiting for something for the other shoe to drop and then something negative to happen. And it looked like that was going to be it when, uh, you know, people were pretty up in arms about that for, about that week one game against Kansas city, where they just got blown out on both sides of the ball. But uh, what, uh, what a difference a week can make when you come back and win. Yeah. Yeah. Gilbert, I think Jose's reading our, uh, our yeah, rundown. I, uh, I was going to ask him about Isaiah Simmons, <laughs> but he answered the question. So I'll let you awesome. have the next it, question. It, it is, you know, a guess is good when he's already a- ahead of us. So <laughs> any, yeah, he's exactly being a Christian. I, I, I love it. So I guess I'll take it away for this one. Uh, Jose, how, how about the rest of the defense? Cause we were, cause we were very curious about Isaiah Simmons. Maybe you can answer a little bit about that because he rarely plays, but then he had that big uh, hit on Hunter Renfro, but overall, this defense, how's it looking? Is JJ Watt still JJ Watt? Uh, I'm not. I haven't really paid attention, paid attention too much for this year because he was, you know, injured last year. So is he? Does he look like the same dude? And then the other thing about it, the Rams are so banged up on the offensive line. They're down to like their third string guard. Uh, their center won't be around. Their their left tackle is dealing with a sprained MCL. So can this front get some pressure on Matthew Stafford? Because when you get pressure on Stafford, usually things go well for the other team. Well, that's the thing. We haven't really seen it. We haven't seen – well, first first of all, J.J. didn't play in the first game, uh, calf injury. Then he plays – he was kind of on a pitch count in the in this last game. But I think second or third play of the game, he got a sack on Derek Carr. So there was, there's been a flash of, yes, J.J. Watt is back to J.J. Watt. But I think, you know, I think the Cardinals might have to sort of accept the fact that, you know, he's just not who he once was. And um, – um, they have really kind of put it on the shoulders of some younger pass rushers to step their game up. Uh, guys like Victor Dimukeji and some of the other uh, outside linebackers, um, Dennis Gardek, who's kind of a, just a, an animal out there. When he gets going, you know, he can really make a difference. But uh, with Isaiah Simmons, you know, they um, he played in that first game extensively, played the whole game or most of it, and he was the guy with the green dot on the back of his helmet. He was the communications guy. All of a sudden, that's gone. It's moved over to a different linebacker. Um, his playing time diminished. So there was really – there must have been something between week one and week two where they realized this guy's just not ready. And so – and that's a big deal. That speaks to, you know, it, has he ever been ready? So uh, immensely talented, but um, but there has to be there, – there was definitely a big change there. I think Simmons took it really well you know, cause he ended up making that big play. Like you guys talked about on Hunter Renfro. Uh, but it's a, I think the defense has a lot of questions to be answered and we're not even talking about a pass rush. We've got a cornerback situation where they were super shorthanded there. Um, and uh, the safeties, of course, Buda Baker, Jalen Thompson are two of the best in the league, but uh, that, that defense has still has a lot of proving to do. Wow. Okay. And uh, Jose, one one more football question. I'm gonna get Victor squeeze in a non-football question here. Uh, I know he's dying to ask this question, uh, <laughs> but uh, one more football question. And it's uh, because again, for the Rams, there another place to deplete it is a secondary. Troy Hill uh, has a groin injury, so he might not play. Their their rookie who stood out against the Falcons, Kobe Durant, might not play. That's pretty much Jalen Ramsey and a bunch of unproven guys. So 
But on the Cardinals side, they don't have DeAndre Hopkins. How's the, how's the rest of the receiving core looking? You kind of brought up already. Yeah. Uh, so I guess give me a summary of, of this offense. Was it kind of a thing where they just clicked for one half and had really bad six quarters before that? Or is this an offense that can compete with, with the Rams, with A.J. Green and uh, Hollywood Brown and Greg Dortch, like you mentioned? Uh, his quarterback in college was John Wolford at Wake Forest. Yeah. Back the rest, the connection right there. Uh, but overall, this offense – can they take advantage of a, of a bang up secondary with the Rams? I think so. I mean, um, you know, AJ came up big in the last game. Uh, he had a drop like right before he caught the two point conversion and then made that play. So this is a guy who's, you know, clearly beyond the prime of his years, but still an effective player. Um, Dorch has a chip on his shoulder. He's, he just wants to go out there and ball out and, and show everybody you passed up, you pass up on me. The Cardinals gave me a chance and I'm going to burn you. Um, he's also pretty effective as a return guy too. Mm. Uh, and, and Hollywood Brown and Kyler have that connection from Oklahoma. They're best friends. Um, I think that connection kind of started to show itself in this last game against the Raiders, uh, made a great catch Hollywood did in the fourth quarter on the drive, you know, that tied the game. Um, and, and what they, I think what they need to do is they need to start taking some deeper shots down the field. Uh, against against that secondary because it's been a lot of just six short passes, you know, stuff to the sideline, maybe stuff over the middle, you know, kind of safety checks. But uh, I think they need to start trying to air it out if they feel like they have an advantage over that secondary and um, and kind of you know put them put them to the test because you know you have guys with that kind of speed as Dorch and um, Dorch and Hollywood Brown take advantage of it, you know, fly down the field and throw them a ball. No, uh, Jose, my, my, my last question has nothing to do with football. I just wanted to know, uh, is this the best Dodgers team you've seen since you've been following sports? I mean, it's got to be, man. I mean, it has to be. Like, they, I watch them a lot, and it just seems like there's not much of a weakness. I, I worry about Craig Kimbrell. I worry about the back end there, the bullpen, but. Um, man, everybody in between the starters and Craig Kimbrell, I mean, that's, you know, they, they lock it down. And I'm really excited about uh, – it, it just seems like it's somebody different every night, and it seems like um, there's really no weakness in the batting order. And these guys aren't like big names, right? There's not a ton of big – you got Mookie, obviously. You got Freddie Freeman. But outside of those guys, you know, there's not a ton of big name, you know, Trey Turner, but he's kind of a quiet guy. So – uh, it's pretty exciting. It's pretty fun to watch uh, watch them go about their business. I mean, the games are – the games, it's like I expect to win almost every night. And uh, I hope they make a good run. It's uh, It will be a lot of fun. It would be nice to see them do it in a full season so nobody can ever like discredit them for winning in 2020. <laughs> Jose, you're, you're going to be busy this fall between the NFL, you know, Dodgers in the postseason, the World Cup. Yeah. I don't know how you're going to handle it, man. But it was good to have you on this show, hearing your story from being in the 805, Moore Park, Oxnard, Fernando Vargas from the 805. I'm a boxing guy, so I know the connection. All the way to Oregon, to Seattle, to Phoenix, man. I appreciate uh, the, your your insight and, and giving us your background and, and putting the grind in Costco. Uh, you're, you're setting an example for us, for people who are, who are trying to make it and push that it doesn't matter you know, how long it's been or what age or what comes your way. You could still be an NFLB reporter for the Arizona Republic. Jose Romero, thank you for coming on the show. Appreciate you guys, man. This was awesome. Best of luck. Keep going. Victor, like we said, there was a bunch of stories that weren't football related with Jose M. Romero uh, from the Arizona Republic, but I think they were worth it. I think people, if you listen to the interview, uh, definitely enjoyed that, you know, hearing uh, the background because sometimes, you know, people want to know how do you become a beat reporter? How do you cover football? How do you get into an NFL locker room? Well, there you go. That's a long path, a long grind from Jose. But then he really, he got into it, man. He, he dropped knowledge about what? J.J. Watt, uh, the secondary, Kyler Murray, Isaiah Simmons, the speedy wide receivers without DeAndre Hopkins. So there is so much to unpack there that now I'm ready to break down this matchup from the Rams point of view, Victor. Yeah, no. And I, for me, it was, it was just like some of the nuggets that he dropped where I, I had no idea about, like, uh, I was trying to remember, uh, 
uh, like some of the stuff with Kyler Murray, like we talked about earlier, where he talks about that he's now he sees him as a leader, which is has been one of the things that has been questioned now since he came into the league about him being a leader. And so that was kind of surprising to hear coming from him. So it looks like he's he's starting to turn that corner now that he got paid. Uh, you know, now now we're gonna see whether or not he can take that next step. And hey, it's his team, man. He needs to he needs to take over now. Yeah, and I know we're gonna get into player matches, but I feel like I want to give a little segment just to Kyler Murray. I, I I know it wasn't in the rundown, but I feel like Kyler Murray, man, just yeah, I don't want to remind you, Victor, but you watch that Raider game and Kyler Murray. Yes. You know, I guess I'll ask you because it's it's been a very shaky career for Kyler as a passer, at least. We all know what he could do as a as a as a you know scrappy. I, I I was asking you know Bobby Wagner. I was like, is there any benefit for a quarterback being that small and then that shifty? And he was like, yeah, you think you're gonna make a tackle? He goes, you know, you know, around you through your legs, whatever. You can't get the you can't grab the guy. So that's very unique. But then, how about the passer, the leadership, reading defenses? Is he better at that? And, and Victor, I, I guess I'll ask you this because you watched the game closely. I got to break down the film still on last week because it seemed like last week was like, oh, that's the guy we paid. That's a franchise quarterback right there. Did it feel like that, that this guy could be an elite quarterback in the future? Because, well, it's already year four for the guy. We can't keep you talking about potential and promising after you got paid, too. Does it feel like this guy's a guy? No, yeah, it, it, it does. He's not the problem with the team. Like, you you can – he he put – uh, Kyler Murray put the team on his back, and he's the reason why that won- they won that game. I mean, part of it was the Raiders playing some like zone uh, defense, and you know they that kind of let them to get back into that game. But no, Kyler Murray can make every throw. Like one, he has one of the most beautiful deep balls that you'll see. And that's another thing. The thing is, right now, is that he, he some of his weapons aren't available. Like DeAndre Hopkins, like like uh, Jose talked about. You know, they got a guy named Dorch. <laughs> you know, we don't, you right. know they got AJ Oh man, AJ Green. You know, and then we don't know if uh, Hollywood Brown's gonna play. He he didn't practice. I think today, uh, at least I saw him not practice because I have him on a fantasy team, and he, he came up on, on on an update there that he hadn't practiced. So you know, and then Zach Ertz has been a rele- relevation there with the Cardinals because uh, when he was with the Eagles, pe- people thought his career was done, but they had Goddard over there. So. But he's been good. He's been a good uh, option for him. The offensive line is kind of shaky there too. You know, I, they have the former Raider Hudson, and outside of that is, you know, that's where I think the Rams are going to probably take advantage of is through that on that off against that offensive line. So, but in Make terms your, of what you, yes, real quick, I'll just answer your question. I'm looking at the injury report right now. Uh, Marquise Hollywood Brown was just a rest day, so he's fine. Oh, okay. Oh, there you go. So he'll have his complement of receivers except for DeAndre Hopkins, who's, you know, suspended for the first six games. So we'll see. Uh, you know, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see how good they play. If they if they're able to uh take the momentum, you know, like they say like in baseball, like the momentum is the next, you know, day's pitcher. Here is can Kyler Murray continue to do what he did against the Raiders in the second half because he's going to have to carry this team now because there's not a lot of talent outside of Kyler Murray. Yeah, you know, the, you, you kind of already stole my uh, my matchup to watch, so we'll get into it. But no, but yeah. just to go off of that, you know, it, it's a good point because you're telling me Kyler Murray has a a, 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 a pretty deep ball. He, he and he and he's going as as a thrower, not just as a, as a scrambler, and he has a lot of speed with Hollywood Brown and Greg Dorch. Uh, or is, I mean, hopefully I'm saying it right, but I know Greg was a college teammate of John Wolford at uh, Wake Forest, and, and John Wolford, I spoke to him in the locker room about him, about Greg. He's not surprised because this guy broke records at Wake Forest. He just needed a shot. I think he got hurt too, and he, and that's why he maybe went undrafted or or, or or he fell, whatever the story is there. But uh, he spoke really highly of Greg. So they, they have some speedsters, and then you don't have no Troy Hill, probably not no Kobe Durant. And then David Long's in the injury report. That leaves you Jalen Ramsey and then Robert Rochelle, who has played three snaps defensively all year. And then Darion Kendrick, the rookie, who has not been active for any game. So that could be an issue. But I'm going to take the flip side real quick, uh, Victor. And then because our good friend, Jose M. Romero, this is why we have people on the show, was telling us that that secondary is pretty thin and shorthanded and inexperienced. So 
I know the defense did, you know, great against the Raiders in the second half, but, you know, this could be maybe the game that Matthew Stafford and the offense finally get some explosive plays. They never get anything down the field. It's very a slow kind of approach. They're just clunking down the field. Cooper Cup, you know, bailed them out on a third down. Oh, there's some plays here for Allen Robinson out last week, but there's no, like, a 40-yard play or, like, they're from, like, the 20 instantly in the red zone or whatever. There's no deep there with, with a 2-2 out that we're expecting. Uh, ben Skoranek's not doing that because he's playing fullback. So it just feels like a lot of interme- intermediate throws. Uh, so if you want to take advantage of this, you know, shorthanded second there, this could be the game finally for these guys. And I and I, I get the whole scheme where you're playing the too high shell and you and they don't want to give you anything up top, and that's been affecting them too. And then also the offensive line with 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 you know pressure and you have very little time to make things work up the field. All right, enough with the excuses, enough with the injuries, enough with the too high shell. Make some plays on the field. That is my matchup to watch here: Matthew Stafford, Allen Robinson, Cooper Cup. Uh, against his secondary of the Cardinals. Man, you led me right into what I wanted to talk Perfect. about. So this is awesome. So one of the things I noticed with from the Cardinals is in the first game, they blitz a lot against the go. Chiefs, right? And so they got killed. And one of the one of the reasons I wanted to ask Jose M. Romero about uh, Isaiah Simmons was because he the, he played most of that game and he got killed by Travis Kelsey, right? And then and then you follow it up against the Raiders and then Darren Waller's having a field day in the first half and for some reason uh, the the Raiders stopped going to it and the reason is is because they started playing zone they stopped blitzing and they started going zone against the Raiders offense and so that that that's what allowed. Um, the defense to kind of play better and and Isaiah Zim is only play. So for me, my player matchup is Tyler Higby because no, the the Cardinals are notorious. The for, roster. Yes, for for uh for kill for letting uh tight ends have big days against them. We saw it with Travis Kelsey, we saw it with Darren Waller, and this goes back a few years now with with Arizona. So that's you know uh, it's going to be Tyler Higby going up against as Jose and Romero called it the star backers whatever yeah, that means yeah. as he said yeah so, so that yeah. now you got me thinking for like uh I'm gonna do a different one for for our show here but um on those who register for my uh you know, we're gonna actually call it something different this week but it's gonna be Rams at Cardinals matchup TV information and predictions uh there's a fantasy sleeper section and I've been pretty uh well there i think i might throw tyler higby there because of you victor i might steal that one from you we'll see well stay tuned because he's gonna be again my fantasy <laughs> guy so okay, okay. there you go but uh, it sounds like a good one yes let's get to our x factor for this game who, who are you going with yeah well how about we start with this i'm always maybe it's me being a little slow but can you define x factor what is is it that, is it kind of like a sleeper okay. is it somebody we're not thinking about Yes. So for X Factor, you want a player that's not a big name like Stafford, like Jalen Ramsey, Aaron Donald. Last week, I went with uh, I went with uh, the receiver Allen Robinson because he was coming off like not getting any any, any uh, targets. He only had two in the first game, so that's why I went with Allen Robinson. So it gotcha. it's up to you. It's somebody who's gonna. Like no one is expecting to have a big day. Like last week, it was Kobe Durant who had a big day. Yeah. That's a yeah. Good one. So, who is your X factor? Yeah, you know, I'm not ready to go on the offense because it just feels like it's gonna be Allen Robinson and Cooper Cup. I, I don't trust the other guys. I'm not gonna trust the cat makers yet either. Uh, the offensive line is very thin. So I'm gonna go defense, Victor. Again, I know no, probably no Kobe Durant. He he was great uh, last week, man. I think they really found something in that guy. We'll see if he comes back. But I'm going to go defense, and I'm going to go somebody who's being forgotten because he's playing next to Bobby Wagner. I'm going with the other inside linebacker, second-year player, Ernest Jones. And we spoke to Bobby today, and he was just, you know, praising Ernest. And, like, it's the little things that he does. So, you know, if you have to have a linebacker – or, sorry, if you need a linebacker to cover, uh, say, uh, Zach Ertz, there we go. Zach Ertz was having, you know, new life in Arizona. I think Ernest Jones could help out. Maybe he's, he's you know, he's not the best in coverage, but, you know, he, he handles his own and say – Bobby Wagner is going to be that extra blitzer. Like he had, a, he has a sack in the last two games. You're going to need some help in the middle, and I think Ernest Jones could do that. And then you can even flip it. Maybe it's Bobby in coverage, and then I think Ernest Jones is uh, such a has a nose for the ball. He can make plays. He can help you out in the running game. He can help you out as an extra, 
a pass rusher on the on the edge or as an extra blitzer. Uh, so I think it's going to be the game where you actually feel Ernest Jones or you see it on the field. You see the in- impact plays like they like where he where he is at all times, but it just doesn't sound or seem like okay, there he is. You can't easily spot him. So I think this would be the yeah. game where he'll do maybe he have like a force fumble or something, a few batted balls. I think Ernest Jones would be an X factor to help out here with his uh, talented uh, Cardinals offense. That's a good one. Like, I, and we're thinking again, we went from the offense and then here we're going to go with the defense as well. I'm going to go with the defense as well. And I'm going to, uh, uh, I'm going to key on the, uh, uh, on the safeties and especially Nick Scott. Nick Scott is my, uh, my pick this week because they're going to have to help out. We don't know, like you, we talked about, we, we don't know the status of Kobe Duran, uh, with Troy Hill on IR now. We don't know who the other, uh, 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 cornerback's going to be opposite side uh, Jalen Ramsey. So for me, it's it's going to be those safeties and how like how are they able to contain Kyler Murray? You don't want him doing what he did against the Raiders, where he's running around for forty seconds, you know, to be able to score a two point conversion. So the safeties, I think, are going to be huge in this game, depending on how uh, Raheem Morris uses them. Whether you know they they put them to as a spy because I, I I don't know if they're gonna use some of the linebackers as spies, whether they want to blitz him. I and I that was the other thing that was just frustrating watching that Raider game too in the second half. Uh Patrick Ram refused to blitz uh Kyler Murray, which is something that K- Kansas City did and they were able to take advantage of that. And I think you have to at some point take some chances on some blitzes because I think most teams are afraid that he's either going to run or get on the edge and run, or he's going to complete beat you down the field. And I think here it's where the safeties come into play for me. And so for me, it's going to, the, 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 the X factor is Nick Scott. No, that's a good one, especially because they, they play a lot of heavy uh, three safeties anyways, and not just like in uh, these uh, dying packages, they use them in a variety of ways. So, um, I think that's going to be a benefit for the Rams because they already have three. And then that way, you know, you just, you know, need a, a, an extra corner or maybe they kind of get this unique way where they make one of the safeties a cornerback. We'll see. You know, uh, Sean McVay is not afraid to get creative like we saw a fullback Vince Karanik. So we'll mm-hmm. see what they do with this adjustment. But, you know, I actually caught up with Robert Rochelle in the locker room because he looks to see this. It seem like the guy who's going to be up, especially if David Long's groin injury is actually serious. So you would think it'd be Jalen and then David Long, but if he can't go, I think Robert Rochelle would be next, and he seems very eager to show what he, he could do out there. So, and he is a promising player that they had high hopes for last year and didn't really pan out. So, uh, regardless of who plays that cornerback in the opposite of Jalen Ramsey, I think you're 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 spot on, Victor, on the safeties. All right, cool. Let's get to keys to the game. Who do you have? Like, what are your keys for the Rams to come out victorious against the Cardinals down in Arizona? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I guess, you know, we kind of already touched on it. I know just for the sake of time, but but I think it's such a big deal is the the scrambling plays, the, the, to get rid of the magician Kyler Murray. You know, obviously, like you mentioned, he does well with the deep ball. He's he's a good thrower, but just get rid of the magic plays, the extending plays. You know, it's, it's easier said than done. You know, obviously, Mariota's not on the level of Josh Allen. Josh Allen burned them, as we remember. Uh, but Mariota didn't really do that. Like I think it was the first drive against the Falcons, and there and he was scrambling, getting out the pocket. I think I tweeted like, "Okay, here we go again." They can't get, can't stop this guy on the run, and then that one third down stop with Bobby Wagner on the blitz. Never really saw it from Mariota ever since uh, that one. So maybe they figure out something there, but Kyler Murray is just a problem. So uh, yeah, that's definitely one of the keys. I know it's an easy one, Victor, but I, I just got no. Say that's it. no, that's big. I mean, because that's that's the guy you need to stop. Like I said, you, you know earlier. He's 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 if he puts them on their back, they can win this game. It's it's up to Kyler Murray. They it, it's it's the you know, if, if you want to win this game, if you're the Rams, you need to stop Kyler Murray. That's where it, it stops with the with the Cardinals. And I and I think the other thing that you we need to focus on, too. And I, I honestly, while you were talking about this, it, it kind of reminded me is James Conner left the game early against the Raiders. And so, you know, you might have a backup there. We don't know if James Conner is going to. Uh, play against the Rams, so I know he was on the yeah. injury report. Did so. not participate. Ankle injury. James. There Conner. you go. Yeah. So that's also, and they haven't been as Jose M. Romero told us he ha- they haven't been able to run the ball. So if they don't establish, it's up to Kyler Murray. They, so and and for me, for me, 
uh, the key to the game for me is going to be Sean McVay and how he uses the 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 offensive line, the banged yeah. up offensive line. How they get, how he helps them out. Whether he uses Karanik again, whether he uses some of the 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 running backs as you told us with Daryl Henderson, you know, to chip or something on JJ Watt. That'll be my key to the game. If he's able to, you know, uh, game plan for that and and uh, give the offensive line help. You know, I don't think I don't think Higby's going to stay and block uh, because you want him to be able to go up. But he's they got weaknesses on those linebackers. You know, they drafted Sabian Collins, they drafted Isaiah Simmons, and they don't use them right for whatever reason. And was part of the reason why I wanted to ask Jose and Romero about that was because I'm just like you you waste you're you're using these high leverage picks and in guys that are you know, that people thought were going to be really good coming out of college and yet you're not using them right. So that's where, that's where I think you can exploit it. So the offensive line is the key for me. If you're able to protect somehow by giving more personnel help uh, to that offensive line, that'll be the key for me. All right, Gil, let's get to the uh, fantasy football be uh, betting spotlight here. So we have the Rams as a three and a half point favorites. The over under is 48 and a half and the money line is at 185. How are you seeing this game? Yeah, 48. Well, last week I didn't get the the over. I got it under, but I got the spread, right? I said the, the, the Rams by four. No way they're going to get the 10 point. That was just insane. Um, I don't want to spoil the the prediction but three and a half is i'll just say this for three and a half for the rams you know it's uh it just shows you that the lack of respect for for the cardinals because say this game was in in sofi stand this would be pretty much a, a touchdown game yeah seven yeah. pretty much so that's not a good sign for the cardinals it, vegas is not you know taking them seriously or maybe vegas you know are just mad about the raiders game uh but uh that's how, how to say that uh, but yeah, I, yeah. I could definitely see the over here, the 48. What is that? Just to do simple math, I, you know, if both teams get over, t you know, 25 points, easy math. I could see them easily being in the 30s. So uh, maybe yeah. late 20s for sure. Uh, I think, you know, hammer home on the over. Uh, and then the money line minus 185. It's too risky when you have a uh, divisional opponents here. So I'll leave alone a three and a half. Uh, but I think it's maybe, maybe a little, maybe a little high. I don't know. I think it'll be a close game, but we'll get there when we get there. Yeah, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna hit the the Rams here. You 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 know I think last week was kind of a you know the the Cardinals you know had Kyler Murray go all Madden mode there and you know and he brought them back. But I think here the Rams I I, I for some reason the Rams just own the Cardinals. McVay has that magic touch here, so I'm gonna I'm gonna take the Rams here and the over. I'm gonna I'm gonna do the same. I play it the opposite way as I did last week. But like I've said, early on in the games, especially when you have warm weather, you try to, especially here on, on the West West Coast, hit those games uh, uh, with the over. And then later on, as, as the season gets colder, then you start hitting the under. But here, and I, I'm not going to mess with the money line here too. Like, <laughs> it, you know, there's, there's no reason to, you know, unless you were going to bet the Cardinals, then you hit the money line. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Let give me one player from the Rams that you're gonna you want uh, the Rams fans to you know focus on this week. Well, you already took Tyler Higby and and <laughs> man, because then I, I feel mean like you have a. Let me give you some of the options. Why don't I do that? You have you have Stafford, who's a QB nine this week. He's he's projected to score around 20 points. You also have Cooper Cup, who's also project he's a wide receiver one who's also projected to score around 20 points. And then you got the two running backs. They're both around 10 and 9 points. And then you can also maybe stream the Rams defense. Yeah. Um uh... I don't think so on, on the defense. I think the Cardinals, like I mentioned, I went over. It's going to be a high-scoring game. And then I, it's too easy to pick Cooper Cup. You're going to play that guy regardless. So I can't give you advice on Cooper Cup. Uh, you know, I, I guess I'll go with this one then because I already had Daryl Henderson last last week and, you know, got you a goal line touchdown. It wasn't crazy, but, you know, like I said, you know, get him in there. We'll get you a touchdown. So I will say start Stafford and Robinson. Like we mentioned, our good friend Jose M. Romero. We got to figure out what the M is. It's really bothering me now. Uh, <laughs> it's a it's a banged up secondary. I think this is a, the game they finally get some explosive plays. And then, do I dare say, Victor? You know, 
less than two interceptions for Stafford, maybe just oh, one yeah. finally. Like that should be a prop right there. Is does he go over one point five interceptions? Because it's starting to become a routine with him with getting right. two or or more. So I'll say he's limited to at least maybe one or less. Maybe it's a clean game. And I think him and Al Robinson have a good connection. I think start Robinson, start Stafford. Yeah, that's a good pick on Allen Robinson. I always forget that there's another receiver along Cooper yeah. Cub, and Allen Robinson is a great pick here because he almost he should have had two touchdowns last week, and so you know, and he's not he's on he's what wide receiver twenty nine, and he's projected for around nine points. So there you go. I mean, yeah. Gilbert's giving you a good option here yeah. with uh, and maybe, Allen Robinson. Maybe take a, if you're really hurting, maybe. Take this Greg Dortch guy because his secondary is banged up for the Rams too on the opposite side. Yeah, yeah, and for me, like I said, it's it's Tyler Higby. Like I even picked him up earlier in our league because I right. was like, I, I have Kyle Pitts. I'm I I've already soured on Kyle Pitts. I heard all this thing about how he was gonna you know be the breakout guy this year. No, like I said earlier with with uh, with the. The Arizona defense, their linebackers are not great. They're they're not even playing them right, you know, and they get torched all the time. So take and and Tyler Higby had a good game last week. He scored over ten fantasy yeah. points. So this is you know, and the Cardinals give up the most. They they usually the tight ends who they play against have their best game of the year against the Cardinals. So yeah, it's Tyler that. Higby is is the the one to go with. Uh, all right, let's get to game predictions to close out the show. Who do you got, Gil? Honestly, I've been going back and forth. I'm not even confident at all about this because, you know, I think about the Rams' weakness with the offensive line, but then I think about the Cardinals. Like, J.J. Watt, you know, could still be J.J. Watt, but then what else do they have after that? And then even, like, their linebackers are not helping out much, so there's not really, a, like, a, a, like, a ferocious front seven. So maybe they could get by. But then you start thinking, well, the depleted secondary for the for the Rams, they got a lot of speed, man, with, with these Cardinals weapons. And then, you know, Colin Murray doing his thing. So it's a lot of back and forth. So instead of just thinking about matchups and figuring out, and then, yeah, the Cardinals are at home. It's a divisional game. The Cardinals are on a high, too. Like, I really was, like, leaning Cardinals. And then, you know, I was thinking about it, and then you kind of brought it up, too, on the show earlier. It's like when their backs are, you know, say that the backs are behind the wall and and and, and – you need to adjust, and you're going to trust the coaches. And I trust Sean McVay more than I do Cliff Kingsbury. Uh, so to scheme up something to get around these deficiencies, these uh, injury hiccups, I think Sean McVay will scheme something up to make it uh, not a, not like a not a benefit, but to just scheme around it and make it just go keep the offense humming, which he did last week against the Falcons. So I will take the Rams here. I'm not too confident, but I think they cover for, for the first time this year. They, you know, I will go. I had a high scoring game. You know, I'm trying to think of yeah, because the Rams are the the Rams are zero and two against the spread this year so far. Yeah, and then they're not really scoring high, so that's my other thing I'm worried about. So I might jack it up here, but I say they finally break out of the the real. This is a real funk breaker. And last week they got thirty one, so I said this week they get thirty three. Cardinals get twenty seven. You know, they win by six points in Arizona. Wow, man. <laughs> I, I I came pretty close as well. I have them 35-29. Okay. I have it as a six point game as well. Uh I just I like I we talked about with you 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 brought it up too. Is I just think Sean McBay is gonna out coach Cliff Kingsbury here. And uh, you know, I, I the de- defensive coordinator doesn't scare me at all. Like some of the stuff, like he's either gonna blitz. If you blitz him, McBay's gonna have something for for them. You know, if you try to play zone, you can always run the ball with Cam Akers and Daryl Henderson and then, you know, play some of that offensive line, try to help them out with, you know, either a Skoranek or some of the other guys that you can bring in. You know, if they bring up uh, Jacob Harris or even Carter, you know, that'll be something where you can use an extra guy there to to help out with J.J. Watt. But, yeah, I just I just I really like you know the Rams here if it was it, you know and I know it's a divisional opponent but McVay has owned Clint King, yeah. Kingsbury Cliff yeah. Kingsbury yeah yeah so he's on them and if it was someone else if it was you know the Niners or something I I probably wouldn't have picked the Rams yeah. here but it's the Cardinals I mean he's he's done well against the Cardinals 
Yeah, I keep thinking one of these weeks we're going to go separate ways on the prediction. Not this week. Uh, for the last three weeks in a row, we've gone with the same team, so we have the same record. Uh, but maybe next week, Victor. But by the way, one fun story before we leave. We were on the phone call with Cliff Kingsbury, the Raspberry reporters, and he just has like this smooth voice. Like it, he wasn't on like on video, so he's just talking on the audio. And every time everybody said, thank you, Cliff, for answering my question, he's like, yes sir like every time yes sir like a smooth guy like like ryan gossin out there so uh something about him man he just makes you like oh this guy's cool you know so it was cool to talk to him yeah but, and I, mean, as a team, I don't know <laughs> yeah aren't you guys as a b reporter just three for three like you guys have been able to uh talk to the opposing because it doesn't yeah. i mean they don't have to right yeah so shout out to uh gary klein of the la times and jordan rodrigue for you know, pushing people to talk to, they do a good job with that. So we're three for three. And then uh, the tough one will be Kyle Shanahan next week. I don't know if he talks, so we'll see if we run out of we, Yeah, we, just don't ask him about there. the injury. Yeah, <laughs> we we won't ask about Jimmy and Trey Lance. But, uh, Victor, anything else we got? I think it was a fun show. I know we got a little long today, but I thought it was a good show with Jose. It's story time. We broke down the game. You got to see the new cat in the background here if you're watching. Yeah. So uh, a lot going on in this episode of was it week three? There we go. Cardinals. Three. The Rams. Yeah, no, um, just subscribe. We got a lot of stuff here on, you know, Compass on the B network, you know, house of horns, subscribe, give us, you know, the, give us the five stars comment, please send us questions. We want to, there, there might be something where we're, 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 uh, there might be a giveaway coming soon. Uh, so please stay tuned. Um, we also have, uh, um what's up bolts with fernando ramirez and his brother uh dan and dago uh they break down the chargers uh and then we also have combat compass uh who did you guys have gilbert uh, we had a uh, sebastian fundura uh he is a rising junior middleweight and this cat's gonna get in the way again uh he is a yeah a rising boxer who's on the show on combat compass he fights at no october 8th at the dignity health sports park in carson so yeah, we're busy with boxing. We're busy with football. And uh, yeah, subscribe to other channels. Combat Compass, Compass on the Beat, What's Up Boats, House of Horns. I'm ready. All right, there you go. Wrap it um, up, Gilbert. On that note, before this cat gets crazy again, ya nos vamos, pues, vámonos.